The book of Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8 and verses 16 and 17 will be our text here this evening. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. This evening I'd like to preach a message on the subject of heirs of God. Heirs of God. So, uh, looking at this, we'll, we'll take verse 16 and then the biggest part of verse 17, or at least the first half of 17 as our text. You know, uh, we've been in Romans chapter 8 for a while, and uh, I like to look at what others have written and preached, and, and whenever I'm studying for these messages, just to kind of see what others have said. And uh, Spurgeon wasn't known to maybe go through a book and preach through it like we often do, but he was a preacher that we respect, and uh, I've, I've been blessed by his writing and his preaching style, and I'm sure that countless others have been as well. I mean, if you, uh, if you pick up a book, book uh, outside of the scriptures to read and to study, I would definitely recommend Spurgeon right there at the top. Well, I was looking to see if he had preached from Romans chapter 8, verse 16 and 17, and uh, I found that he had, of course, and um, <coughs> at the beginning of that message, I can't remember what he called it, but um, uh, he said this, he said, this chapter, the 8th of Romans, is like the Garden of Eden full of all manner of delights. Here you have all the necessary doctrines to feed upon and luxurious truths with which to satisf satisfy your soul. One might well have been willing to be shut up as a prisoner in paradise, and one might well be content to be shut up to this one chapter and never be allowed to preach from any other part of God's Word. If this were the case, one might find a sermon in every line, nay, more than that, whole volumes might be found in a single sentence by anyone who was truly taught of God. I agree with Spurgeon on that. What a blessing chapter 8 has been. What a blessing... Romans has been to really study and, and to look at. And of course, we've only scratched the surface, even though I do sometimes go pretty slow through some of these passages. Uh, I suppose that volumes indeed have been written. Uh, Martin, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones did a 14-volume commentary on the book of Romans. Uh, it's on my wish list. If anybody, if anybody uh, wants to know my size of what I what what I wear, I, I wear about a size 14. D. Martin Lloyd Jones commentary on Romans. Uh, but uh, now that's that's a joke. Well, it is on my wish list, but I'm not I'm not asking for donations or anything. But indeed, there have been many who have written. He's one of them. There are others. Manton wrote, uh, Thomas Manton, I believe it was. Uh, then there was uh, Robert Haldane, uh, and then uh, and, and, and a couple of others as well. Haldane is probably one of the best commentaries, uh, volumes on the book of Romans. He was a Baptist. His dad was a Baptist too, I, I just recently found out. His dad... James Haldane wrote a commentary on Galatians. It's hard to find. And the reason why it's hard to find is because being a Baptist, he had a lot to say about 
about biblical scriptural baptism. And uh, so that didn't make it a bestseller. If you want to write a book that's a bestseller, avoid, avoid the so-called controversial doctrines. Um, but they're biblical and they need to be preached. And so we appreciate those men that have written on them. And, and, and certainly Spurgeon uh, and everybody else who has taken time to read and to study Romans chapter 8 finds some great things here in this chapter. Last week we looked at verse 15. And uh, the week before that we were in verse 14, and these verses are all connected with what we have here today before us in verses 16 and 17. In fact, uh, it is, if, if you were to put a theme, I guess, in, in, this, in this section of Romans chapter 8, it is assurance. It is assurance. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different angles you could look at it, but certainly... Uh, what I glean from this is assurance. And, and, and like the songwriter said, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. And, and, and what, a, what a joy, what a thought to consider. Oh, there's so many things that we could think about today. We could think about a lot of different things. And even as we go home and uh, throughout the day, we could think about a lot of different things, but what a joy and a blessed assurance it is that we are in the family of God. To have God as our Father and Jesus Christ as our elder brother, to have heaven as our portion. The dwelling of the Holy Spirit. I mean, why should we desire anything more? Uh, truly, uh, when we think about happiness, you know, in this world, some people's happiness hinges on certain things. Uh, their happiness hinges on a great job. Their happiness hinges on the relationship that they have with their family. Their happiness hinges on the stuff that they get. But beloved, my happiness today is not dependent on any of those things. And your happiness shouldn't be either. Uh, our joy can be found in the Lord. And so, it shouldn't hinge on our children, although our children make us happy. It shouldn't hinge on our spouses, although our spouses should certainly bring us joy, and we should bring joy to our spouses. You see, it goes both ways. Our best of relationships in this world will someday not be there. Things happen in life. People move away. People die. And all of that. But praise God. We are heirs of God. We are the children of God. We are the sons of God. We are joint heirs with Christ. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, First John chapter 3 and verse number 1, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. And then he says in verse 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. There's different <coughs> levels of love that people have uh, for one another in this world. I mean, I mean, there's the love that a parent has for their child. There's the love that uh, a child has for his parents. There's the love that a spouse has for his spouse. 
There's the love that the pastor has for the church. And, 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 and there's all sorts of levels of love. You know, the, the love that I have for Jill is not the same love that I have for Brother Ray. You know, it's a different kind of a love, right? But none of us, regardless of how much we may love somebody or be loved by somebody else, none of us can match the love of our God. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Last time we considered the fact that you know, we were once like the children of wrath, but now we're the children of God. What a joy it is. What great love. And I'm talking about this great love that, that Christ would come down, that the Father would send Jesus, as John 3.16 tells us. The love that was expressed by our triune God. And so let's look there at our uh, in, 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 in this passage here, 1 John 3, and then we'll go back to Romans chapter 8, but he says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. You see, we don't like to wait for the blessings of God and this sonship to go into effect until till the time that we go into heaven. It's here now. I'm the child of God. I am the son of God right now. And so I'm sure of heaven. You see, what great things are to come, but what great things we have right now. You see. In Romans chapter 8, Verse 16, it says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Again, this is present tense. Praise God for the witness of the Spirit. Now, as we look at this, beloved, this is the same Spirit that we were introduced to in verse 15. If you remember, it says, For we have not received the spirit of bondage again, to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit of adoption, the Holy Spirit, the sons of God, the daughters of God, the children of God, may be assured of our adoption because it is witnessed by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit, as He indwells us, as He's in the heart of the believer, joins His testimony with His Spirit in confirmation of the truth that we are the sons of God. When we think about this, go with me to... Uh, let, let's just look at the Spirit's witness in Scripture to start off with here. In 1 John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And verse 14 says, This is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of Him. Notice, we have confidence. We have the, the, these things are written that we may know that we have eternal life. That's why these things are written here. Those things that spring up in our lives, the fears and the doubts and all that, those things could be put to rest through the 
reading of God's Word. Through the prayer, through the fellowship that we have with our Lord. You know, uh, my grandfather used to have a sign in his office, in his study there at the church. And uh, uh, it was uh, not as close to the Lord as you once were. And then the question was, reckon who moved? Far too often we get so caught up in this world, the things that the world has to offer, that we neglect the fellowship that we should have with our God. We neglect the reading of God's Word. We neglect prayer. Neglect the fellowship of God's people. The coming together of worship so on and so forth, and uh, then uh, those doubts rise up, and those fears. He says, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, you may know that you have eternal life. Back there in verse uh, chapter 3 and verse 10, In, in, in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 10, it says, In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of devil, whosoever doeth not righteousness, is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Now I read that because we find here, the Spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Too often we read this, in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 10, and we use it to measure everybody else. You know, uh, questions come up about people and that sort of thing. And, and this says, in this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Well, guess what? The Bible is to be our guide to measure people and all that sort of thing, but remember... It is also, and very much so, a mirror by which we can examine ourselves. And, and, and the people of God should find great encouragement in this. In Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8 and verse 10, I'm sorry, Romans 8 and verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You see this leading of the Spirit. He says very clearly, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they might be the sons of God. No, that's not what it says at all. It says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You see, I know my birth certificate. I know who it says my parents are. I can take you and show you them. I can show you pictures. And I can, I can go through and even begin to do my genealogy and tell you what kind of bloodline I come from, from in this physical world. When I was in high school, I became kind of obsessed with it. And when the Bible warns against endless genealogies, certainly there is such a thing as endless genealogies. It's a fun hobby, but uh, don't, don't get too caught up in it. What a joy it is to learn who your family is, at least most of the time. Sometimes you find some people in the uh, family tree that you're kind of ashamed about, and you don't talk about them too much. But how much more greater it is to know that you are the Son of God, that you are the child of God. You see, the Holy Spirit's witnessing through the Scriptures here is true evidence. It's solid evidence, solid proof. Let us remember that as we read these verses, and for that matter any verse, that this is from the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit indwells in us, but the Holy Spirit also gave us the Scriptures. 
in 2 Peter chapter 1, Second Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You see, when we, when we talk about Paul writing the letter to the Romans, or, or Peter writing this epistle, or, or Matthew writing his gospel, uh, or, 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 or Moses writing the book of Genesis, or Exodus, or any of the others there, of uh, the first five books of the Bible, let us understand those men were instruments that wrote God's Word. That this is the Holy Spirit speaking to us as we study the Scriptures. I know some confessions of faith like to say that the, the, the Bible is infallible and and, 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 and that it is uh, true in its originals. But folks, there's none of the originals that are left. Some folks like to criticize the Bible and, and our, our King James Version. And say, well, in the original it said this. How do you know? How do you know? Because the originals have long since been either burned up or used up. Burned up because the enemies of God tried to destroy the Scriptures and used up because the churches of God wore them out. If you've got a favorite book at home, you read it all the time, go and look at it. It's not new anymore. But not only did God give us His Word, but He also promised to preserve it. And, 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 and so, I can rest my head, I can stand here in this pulpit, I can study, I can preach, and I can say, thus saith the Word of God. This is God's Word. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to us through even that this English translation that we've used for some 500 years. In Acts chapter 28, Brother uh, Robbie Jeffries preached a really good message on the King James Version and, and this sort of thing back in, uh, I don't know what year it was, I just, I just saw the video online. Maybe I'll post it on my Facebook page or something if you're interested. But he did a real good job with the history and everything. Acts chapter 28 and verse uh, 25. And when they had agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers. You see, Paul was preaching here. He said, and he began to quote from Isaiah. Uh, he said, Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah. And you and I, when we read Paul's words, we could say, Well spoke Paul. Or we could say, well spake the Holy Ghost by Paul, you see. And both would be accurate, but we got to understand something. Well, Paul, Isaiah, all these fellows, they were speaking the, the words, they were writing the words of the Holy Spirit. In Hebrews chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, 
you will hear his voice. Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. This is written. You see, this was written in the Old Testament. But he didn't say, the Holy Ghost said. He said, the Holy Ghost saith. Speaking now to us. It wasn't just to them. It was to us. Every command of the Lord, every written portion of the, of the Word, yes, it may have a historical context, and we should never uh, neglect that portion of it, uh, but let us remember that this Word is relevant to all of us, even this very hour. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, begin at verse 14, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. That from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You see, every scripture Every chapter, every verse, every line, jot and tittle is preserved. It is from the Holy Spirit and it is profitable to us. We need to continue in these things. And indeed, by the grace of God, we will continue in them. So the Spirit speaks or witnesses to our spirit. In the Word, but we must understand something as well when we when we consider this that the Holy Spirit does not ever do anything or lead anyone away from His Word. This is why it's so important. The Holy Spirit will not lead you to delusion. He'll not lead you to uh, things that. People come up with all the time a mistake for internal revelations differing from the Word of God. You know, there's some folks out there who say, well, if you, if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. There's people out there who will tell you that if you're not a member of their church, you're not saved. Where's the assurance in that? I'm not a member of their church. Never had their baptism. Never even sat through one of their services. I don't speak in tongues, at least not what they're talking about. And so there's no assurance to be found in those things. You see, that's why it's important for men women, boys and girls, all of God's people to get into the Word of God. Understand something. This Bible that you have in your hands, it came at a price, a major price. Not only were many of the men who were inspired to write it persecuted, but even those who dared to translate it into our language. Many of them died. Wycliffe and some of those fellows, I know the kids have been kind of learning about them, but they died for the idea, the dream that even the farmer or the peasant would be able to understand the Word of God better than the Pope himself. The 
Spirit bears witness to our spirits. We have this testimony of our spirit when we are convicted of sinfulness, misery, ruin, when we have come to understand our totally our total depravity and inability to relieve ourselves from the curse of the law we have broken. And at the same time, we're convinced of the righteousness of Almighty God. We have the testimony of our spirit when we are born of the Holy Spirit from above, having been saved by the grace of God. When we're willing to trust nothing, nobody, but the blood of Christ. When we experience and observe the effects of sanctification begun and carried on in us. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. In Romans chapter 8, there in verse 17, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. The fact of God's people being heirs is deduced from the fact that we're children. In this world, we may understand a little bit about children being heirs, their parents' possessions. And uh, so... When a, a, a when 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 a parent dies, then the children will inherit whatever goods that they may have in this world. Maybe a little bit of money, maybe a uh, a house, maybe a a car, whatever. But how much more, spiritually speaking? A blessing it is to know that those of us who have been born again and adopted into the family of God, that we also have an inheritance. All of God's people are heirs. Not so the sons of this world. Take, for instance, earthly princes. We won't go there, but Jehoshaphat gave his Younger sons, greater gifts of silver, of gold, of precious things with fenced cities in Judah. But the kingdom he gave to Jehoram because he was the firstborn. You can read about that in 2 Chronicles chapter 21. But here's the point. You and I, we may think we ain't got much, and perhaps we don't, worldly speaking. There's always somebody that's got more than what we do, regardless of where you are financially, uh, regardless of where you are uh, in this world's economy. Here's the deal. You and I, we are higher than even the kings of the earth. In Psalm 89... In the 89th Psalm, in verse 27, Also I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. Remember back years ago, and maybe some of you all remember it too, Brother Joe Wilson used to sing the song, I'm a child of the king. 
What a great blessing that is to understand that we're not just a child of a king, we're a child of the king, the king of kings and the lord of lords. In Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 through 12. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us. Let's start with verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you're saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I'm reading chapter 2, and I wanted Ephesians chapter 1. But that's a good good passage to read too. But Ephesians chapter 1, beginning verse 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted, in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He hath purposed in Himself. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. You see... He chose us before the foundation of the world. A lot of times people get that all confused and they talk about how they chose the Lord. Listen folks, it, it, you were done chosen long before, long before you were even born. We were predestinated unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. Why? According to the good pleasure of his will. Not because God looked through time and saw how beautiful of a child of God you were going to be, and so that's why He chose you. That's not it at all. Some folks think that God is a glorified fortune teller, or, or, or that everything that happens happens because of you and me. But that ain't it. That ain't it. He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. We have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him that worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. So many times the Bible speaks of this inheritance or us being heirs. I'd like for us to take just a few moments here to kind of go through some of these. In Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. 
There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You see, regardless of where you are in this world, regardless of your status, you are, if you've been saved, if you, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. He says there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, male nor female. You see, in that time period, those things made a big difference outside of the church. Indeed, you go back uh, even not very far in our history and you'll find that those things made a big difference even in America. It's kind of interesting to study the, the pages of church history and really I'm talking about not just the things that guys like John Christian wrote and Armitage and all those fellows uh, but I'm talking about to dig in and find copies of the actual minutes of those churches and what they did and how they conducted business. You know, I'm talking about slaves. I'm talking about women who didn't have any rights hardly at all outside of the church, in the communities, and in, 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 the, in the places where they lived. They certainly would have never had a voice, never a vote, and yet they had all these things. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Verses 13 and 14. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? <coughs> Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? You see, the angels have a, have a duty and responsibility. And what's their, what is it too? Well, their ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation. In Hebrews chapter 6, in verses 17 through 20, Hebrews 6, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two mutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth in, into that within the veil. And verse 20 says, Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The heirs of promise. Not, not set by our actions, but established by His actions. It's impossible for God to lie. And uh, He says we have this hope as a sure anchor of the soul. In the book of Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Beware of these fellows that talk about the Old Testament being saved because of the works that they did, not at all. Noah 
found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And so he was heir of the righteousness which is by faith. In Titus chapter 3, Titus chapter 3 and verse 7, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So check it out. The Bible tells us, our text shows us how secure we are. If children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Hear me now. Adam, Adam was called a son of God. <clears throat> and in his lifetime, it didn't take him long. You see, he was called the son of God, and he was given lordship of the Garden of Eden, but it didn't take him long to ruin that. And he lost it. He lost it. Satan and his angels were the sons of God by creation, but they fell. Those who are joint heirs with Christ, and that's what we are, will never fall or fail. Our inheritance is secured by our union with Christ. In... in, in In 1 Peter chapter 1, First Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again, unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance. Incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You see, it's an incorruptible inheritance. It's never going to get lost, ruined, stolen, or taken away. And Peter, as he wrote these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I'm sure that he would... Man, I, I just can't imagine, but what... Peter got excited over this. And you and I, because... because... Uh, because of what our text says there, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. This ought to make us leap for joy and be excited for what great things God has done for us. In fact, somebody might say, well, preacher, that's so good and well, but what about these troubles I'm going through? What about these trials? What about the... It's, the, it's not even winter yet, and I'm already sick of winter. You know, I got the wintertime blues. What are you talking about? Excited. Well, he answers that too. Verses 6 through 9, notice what he says. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, Though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, in whom, th though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. <laughs> praise the Lord. Even if we're going through trouble, even when troubles and trials come, it's only for a season. It's only for a little while. You see, 
Trials are always for a reason and only for a season. That's what that's telling us. It's not going to last. But I'll tell you what does last is our inheritance. Our salvation. The end of our faith, even the salvation of your souls. Our very worst times are just for a little bit in the greater scheme of things. Because guess what? David Green will live forever. And if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you've been born again, you too are going to live forever. When the writer wrote Amazing Grace, he said, even after 10,000 years, we've just begun. We can't fathom our, our minds around what it means to have eternal life. But I tell you this. What a joy it is to know, to be assured of these promises. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the best way I can explain eternal life is this after 10,000 years how much time you got forever <laughs> after 20,000 years after 2 billion years what do you got left forever and I'm thankful that God saw fit to make our time upon this earth a short time and give us eternal life when all things Things will be passed away. All things will be new. To think about that our life is but a hand breath or a shadow. Or, uh, all the different ways that the Bible describes the brevity of life in this world. But to understand that we've got forever with the Lord. If children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. <coughs> And so in closing, I just want us to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 23. You know, let's go on up to verse 21. Sometimes when I'm studying, I think to myself, well, maybe I can shorten it here or do this. I might as well just write the things out that need to be read. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Beginning at verse 21. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Paulus or Cephas, or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's. For the child of God, for the... For the sons and the daughters of, of, of God, all things are yours. For you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. That's something to get excited about, folks. We have this assurance through our God, Jesus Christ, died on the cross of Calvary for evil and wicked people like us who were chosen before the foundation of the world. We've been adopted into the family of God. We've been born again there. And, 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 and I mean, our sins are covered by the blood of Christ. Our Savior died, rose again the third day, conquering death, hell, and the grave. It makes intercession for us even at this very hour. Oh, I love the prayers of my brothers and sisters in Christ, but how much more. What a joy it is to know that Christ prays for us. I'm telling you, we have the Holy Spirit that is with us, and He's given us His Word. We are of all men, all women, most blessed. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. This ain't a 
maybe, might, could be kind of a thing. This is, this is it. We have assurance. And we are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. Praise God. Lord willing, next time we'll finish up verse 17 and then go on into verse 18 as well and maybe a couple other verses after that, depending. Let's stand to be dismissed. And uh, Brother Ray, would you please pray for us?